the management of wildlife in Wyoming is largely funded by people who buy hunting and fishing licenses. The Wyoming Department of Fish and Game is facing a large budget shortfall and not sure what to do about it. Cheyenne attorney David Wilms proposed some solutions in a recent law review article. He spoke to our Leslie Wagoner earlier. What are your specific ideas for additional funding for game and fish or for wildlife management? They're facing some uh, pretty tough times and, and they're having trouble getting license fee increases passed. And, and uh, one of the things that I think uh, you know, we looked at is you need to broaden the funding base, the funding source. You know, sportsmen, hunters, and anglers have been bearing a lar largely the burden for funding wildlife management in Wyoming for uh, generations, and that funding model is really unsustainable. So we, we proposed a couple of uh, alternative mechanisms to, to fund, and you know, one of them being uh, collecting existing taxes already being collected by the state on uh, sporting goods, sporting equipment. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second being a diversion of funds from a statutorily created uh, diversion into the uh, Permanent Mineral Trust Fund. So we have a constitutional requirement to divert mm -hmm. a certain percentage of our uh, mineral revenues into the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund. But we also have in 2005 a statutory requirement of 1%, which translates roughly in the uh, to I think the past uh, biennium, I can't remember if it was the biennium or the annual uh, fiscal year, but it was about $280 million was that 1% that, hmm. that went into the Permanent Minimum Trust Fund. And so the idea was taking a portion of, of each of those funding sources mm -hmm. to help more f fully fund the agency and to broaden its funding base. Okay, so not taking away anything from the current model at, but adding to it. Exactly. That's more what you mean. Exactly. And in your article that you did with Ann Alexander, you talk quite a bit about this North American model of wildlife conservation. Can you explain a little bit about that and why it's problematic? Oh, sure. The, so the North American model, it really finds its roots you know, back to the, the late 1800s. You know, the, when the country was settled, there was this, uh, this belief that wildlife was plentiful, abundant, a limitless resource. And so a lot of species were either harvested to extinction or to the brink of extinction for commercial purposes and other purposes. And, and conservationists of the time began to recognize that there was a problem and, and started to impose uh, the first sets of regulations, restrictions on, on harvest, and switched from this model of commercial harvest to uh, a model of uh, hunters and anglers taking mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they started charging license fees. So it became this user pays system. The idea being you want to take an elk, you'll get an elk license and that money will go back to the agency and will fund uh, management of elk. So elk will be there the next year. So it was this user based system. Uh, that's changed over time. Yeah, so you know, various laws have come into place and, and new new interests and uh, uh, for wildlife management have come into place and new strains on this model. And so over the 100 years, 120 years of this uh, model, it's really changed and, the, and it's no longer just a consumptive uh, user-based model, or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, Who are some other other users then? Users can be pretty broad. You know, it can be both, I, I believe both consumptive and non-consumptive users. And so you have, for example, energy industry is a large uh, consumptive user. You know, habitat fragmentation is a big part of, of uh, species management and can impact populations. And so even though if they don't buy a license and go out and take an animal, there are still impacts to species. So there's a consumptive use there. You know, other industries like agriculture, for example, have some impact because of the way land is managed for uh, you know, their commercial purposes. And, and, uh, and then you also have your non-consumptive users. You have your backpackers, your bird watchers, okay. your tourists that mm -hmm. go to parks you know, because they want to see the wildlife. Right, so they don't have a voice right now in the game, maybe as much, so to speak. It, it, it's, a lot of them would say that, yes. Yeah, and that seemed to be the case. It's still a relatively new, uh, article and concept, and it's really meant to, like, uh, it's not a silver bullet, it's not really meant to be the end all be all, this has to be the way that f the funding problems are solved. It's wanting to start the dialogue and say that we have to look beyond just license fees and increasing license fees. We have to look to other sources of revenue, uh, and, and we have to do that in a responsible way and say that the other sources of revenue that we're looking at that are, are actually tied to uh, users of wildlife. You know, 
and, and really, I mean, and to some extent, everybody's a user of wildlife, and wildlife is considered a trust resource for the state. I mean, it's, it's everybody's, and it's the state's responsibility to manage it for everybody. And so we have to figure out a way to fund that uh, yeah. for future generations. Well, I know one of the things Game and, or two, I guess, the things Game and Fish has in mind is to increase license fees, but also to have this big game trophy game raffle and that's their idea of increasing funding. What do you think of their idea? Well, so they started the big game raffle this past year. They had it for the first time, and, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I want to say it generated $300,000, something. Okay. I mean, it's not an insignificant amount of money that it generated. But when we're talking about the funding shortages going forward and what mm -hmm. we're looking at needing, $300,000 is a drop in the bucket for what it's going to take to fully fund wildlife management going forward. And the raffle is still dependent on hunters and anglers entering the raffle because the result of the raffle are, are licenses. Uh, so I, I think the, the raffle is one piece of a much bigger uh, pie, right, you know, one right. part of a much bigger solution. And it doesn't really get away from the dependency on hunters and anglers, which by the way are, you know, nationwide, their numbers over the past, you know, 25, 30 years are on a steady decline. Yeah. So you're not seeing more hunters and anglers coming into the field, so it's hard mm. to depend on them for every source of revenue. Would you say maybe that hunters might like the, the North American model because it gives them a really hu huge voice, perhaps, in the way wildlife is managed? And for example, some would say that they vilify predators um, because the predators are after the same game that they are. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I'm a hunter myself, I'm an angler myself. I, I completely see that side of it. I mean, it, it's the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and when the Wyoming Game and Fish Department was established, it was really for managing game and fish, and game they were defined as huntable species. And so, yeah, there is, uh, there is this, probably this fear amongst uh, hunters and anglers that if you expand this model to include other users, that it could weaken the, the voice of the hunter. Which is why I, I suppose I proposed uh, the funding sources the way I did, uh, because what you're what you're not doing that way, is you're not, for one, you're not increasing, you're not creating a new tax, so you're not going out there and saying you know, a stamp for bird watchers mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, you're using an existing revenue coming into the state, so uh, and it's it's coming from very specific places, um, so mineral severance money that's coming from the energy industry. You know, they already have some say in wildlife management you know, and some influence over it. Uh, so you know, arguably, you know, will it increase their say, you know, potentially? Uh, and I know it's a risk, but frankly, it's a risk we're going to have to take mm. if we want this model to continue, if we want to yeah. be able to continue to adequately fund wildlife in the future. Yeah. Well, thanks, David. This has been so interesting to talk to you. Well, thank you. In addition to practicing law, Wilms has a BS in wildlife biology and management.